Fly a fair nation. Fly a fair nation. Thank you for tuning into the Pointless Talks podcast. On this episode, we'll be sitting down to speak with the founder of Equality Youth Jamaica and the Gay Agenda Manifesto. Um, hello. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Okay. Thanks for having me. No problem. Thank you for calling in. Um, I'm not sure if you're comfortable using your name or anything of the sort, if you're completely okay with it. So you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, I'm good on my name. I'm Glenn Roy Murray. I am the Associate Director of Programs and Advocacy at JFLAG. And I would describe myself as more the conceptualizer of the agenda because there were many authors that brought it together. Okay. Well, before we get into the full discussion about the JFLAG um, and the manifesto, I'd like to get like a background on you. So, yeah, like just a little bit of information about who you are as a person and things of that nature. Cool? Okay. Yeah, man, that's fine. Okay. Do you identify as a member of the LGBTQ community? Yes, I identify as a cisgender gay man. Okay. Are you out, like, to parents, family, friends, etc.? I'm out to parents, out to family, friends. Yes, I'm out. (laughs) In all the ways that you can be out, yeah. Okay. Um, How was that conversation when you're coming out to your parents? Um, When my mom and I went on a five-year journey from non-acceptance to to self-acceptance, with the, well, and it's mostly my mom with the, I have family members who, uh, who know, like I came out to my uncle who, who I was close to and a cousin, but in terms of who I really had a relationship with based on who was um, close to me growing up, it's really just my mom. So, okay. yeah. Okay, so you guys went through the whole, did she do the whole non-believing thing or was yeah, it? Yeah, she did. I almost got kicked out, but oh. we worked that out. Oh, wow. Do you live at home still? No, I live on my own now, but I visit every Sunday for my good old Jamaican Sunday. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Um, have you lived in Jamaica your whole life? Yes, I have. Okay. Have you personally experienced any like negative backlash for being gay? Well, I'm I'm also effeminate, so I've always been teased at some point. You know, I've fa- I've faced the different slurs, but I also kind of benefit from the whole being smart thing in Jamaica. So I get a little a bit of pass, so I'm effeminate, but he's bright, so he gets away with some of it. But I've definitely been harassed verbally, um, but it's never um, matured into physical violence. Okay. How old were you when you first realized that you were gay or possibly think that you may be? Oh, I didn't hear that. I said, how old? How old? Yeah, how old were you when you first, like, thought that you might be gay or were thinking that, you know, you might be questioning? Hmm. Well, I guess I first quest, or I first, I mean, it's kind of weird for me because I just assumed that I wasn't. And then when I realized that I liked a guy, I was about, like, 15. Okay. It was, I said, yeah. But, I mean, if I, when I look back at it, I was like, yeah, but you were kind of doing cool things <laughs> from, you were, like, two. So, oh, okay. Okay, so for you to accept it, it took a little bit before you finally said, okay, this is what it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you do you work for someone? Are you like self-employed or do you work for something outside of the organizations that you're involved in? Well, Jeff, I work full-time for JFLAG. Okay. I, I, I have a paid job there. But I also um, I am a, like a tutor. Let me use the proper term. I'm a tutor <laughs> at... The University of the West Indies, where I teach our constitutional law. Okay. Um, and yeah. You graduated from UWE, right? Yes, in 2014. Okay. Okay. Um, as far as JFLAG and everything goes, do you guys have sponsors um, for the cause of everything that you guys are doing with all the events? I see you guys put on many events and things like that through the community, through JFLAG and all the other organizations linked to LGBTQ awareness and things of that nature. So we have our international donors. Um, so we get funding from various um, international organizations, some philanthropic um, organizations and people so, and people as well, who from the UK and the US who give us who give us a lot of our funding. But we also get funding through um, the government from, through the Ministry of Health. Okay. From international, they get international funding and provide funding to us to do some of our programs. Okay. And then uh, for Pride, we also get local sponsorship for some of our, for some of our Pride activities. 
Okay, is there, I see you say, you know, international things. Is there anything locally from the Jamaican government or Jamaican um, companies that are ben um, sponsoring you guys? So, so yeah, local sponsorship. So for Pride specifically, we'll have um, cash and kind coming from different local entities. Okay, with the prob um the sponsorships that you have, is everything that you've received is it from people that you've reached out to, or are these people, or has anyone approached you guys to offer sponsorship? Is everything from you guys reaching out, or have some of them approached so you? It's a mixture of both. Um, so, for for from the local side, it's much more mm -hmm. us reaching out, but internationally, it's a mixture of us applying for grants and um, philanthropic organizations wishing to support the cause. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering about that because I'm like, I'm pretty sure you should be getting sponsorship from, you know, the home base, but, you know, you never know. Okay, so when did you start with Equality Use J? I was, I, I Googled you, and <laughs> I saw that you have quite a few organizations that you started um, in reference to women's rights. Mm. And I was looking and I saw that, you know, you are basically like one of like the head people as far as um, EYJ goes. So I was wondering... When no, exactly? Not. Well, y your face is everywhere, though. <laughs> so you were saying I saw, like, even when I was watching the videos and everything, like, all the reels, like, you're you're dead center with that. I mean, there are other people as well, but you're one of the faces that are recurring when I'm looking up, you know, all the information and things of that nature. Well, so I start working, I started doing work with the J-Flag in about 2014 um, when I was finishing up my, I had finished my law degree at the time. And I was just doing um, my one of my lecturers connected me to them, okay. so I built a relationship with them there. And then in 2016, I got an internship with JFlag, and I also had started with their women's affiliate We Change as their policy officer. And then throughout that period, um, through my internship that matured into my full-time employment, um, I supported the activities of Equality Youth um, because they're also an affiliate of JFlag. So. Through my role then as policy and advocacy manager, that's why I had done a lot with EYJ because I'm that touch point legal person in the office. Okay. Um, I watched the equality, um, the EYJ live video that you guys did after the manifesto was released. And a ah. few of my questions were answered, but for the people who haven't watched it, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that you may have answered in the video. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> the number one question I've been hearing is why the title, the gay agenda, because everybody knows the negative connotation that it brings. So one more time, just explain it for the people listening. <laughs> why did you guys decide that the gay agenda was a good title for the manifesto? Uh, so I like to tell the story from like where I had originally came up with the idea in late 2016. So we originally recognized that every time you use the word equality, it, it, people started to take it to being gay and that we're talking about LGBT issues. I was like, no, equality is broader than that. So I thought, oh, let's present. Yes, we have an agenda. It's an equality agenda. And that's how the idea started. And when we were doing our planning for 2017, um, someone said, but why not just call it the gay agenda anyways? And I thought, wait, hmm. and I, and I took some time and I thought about it. And I said, if, if, if we're trying to fix equality by making it focus on LGBT issues, it does the exact thing that I don't want it to do. Mm -hmm. So I felt it was important to disarm those who present the gay agenda as a negative thing by presenting a broader vision of the LGBT community coming from members of the community about what we want Jamaica to be like. So it allows us to reclaim a word that has traditionally been used to be negative, used to oppress, mm -hmm. to kind of subjugate us. But also, it's the kind of thing that sparks a conversation in the way an equality agenda wouldn't. And so it has that eye-grabbing feature, but it also mm -hmm. is something that we can mobilize around as a community and says, yes, we have a gay agenda and this is it. Okay. I mean, I thought as much from looking at it because my thing was it's clickbait. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if you listened to the interview I did with Majan Webster where I was saying that I'm I pretty did. sure every member of the LGBTQ sees that and is like, oh my gosh, no. But at the end of the day, anybody who isn't directly involved or 
necessarily interested in finding out what's going on, it's going to grab their eye and they're going to be like, oh, wait a minute. What is this? You know what I'm saying? So I understand it from that standpoint. But did you feel like there would be any negative? Like, did you did you worry that there would be more negative feedback because of the title? Um. So it was always present in our minds that persons might react negatively to the term gay agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something that we definitely thought about in terms of what the content was and how it would look and with the kind of activities that we would do that involved it. But at the same time, we've also felt like it was very important to just address the reality that every time an issue comes up and every time, even now social justice issues come up, mm-hmm. the, the the one thing that is often thrown out there is this blanket statement, oh, it's a gay agenda. Mm-hmm. And it's used to shut down conversation. So rather than giving the power, the power of the word gay, which is, I mean, for it's ours, no matter uh, how what the history of its use is, it really has come to represent us as a community, um, whether we liked it or not. We give the power of the word gay over to persons who have no interest in promoting the rights of LGBT people. And we definitely felt that while persons might hesitate to look at a document like this and, and, and there will be a certain level of distrust, the overall benefit of disarming those that would shut down a conversation using the term gay agenda by presenting it and allowing it to open up a conversation was far more useful. And already we've seen it open doors in terms of who now wants to engage us about the document and what potential it has for shifting the narrative about the community. Mm -hmm. Because when people talk about the LGBT community in Jamaica, they don't talk about LGBT unless it's us or somebody who has been sensitized by us. It's usually just gay and gays, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so if it is now that gay can represent a much more fulsome vision for the community, then I think it does better for us. And it's definitely something that we can take and run with and make it our own. Okay. Have you guys, I see you guys doing a lot of events and parties and things of that nature, pride and et cetera. Have you guys reached out? I'm, I'm not living in Jamaica, so I don't know the exact extent of you know what you guys do as far as entertainment goes but do you guys mm-hmm. reach out to like radio stations and tv stations for any kind of like broadcasting or informational like anything like that so so we don't generally go over to radio stations and tv stations for broadcasting we do engage so if we have our advocacy messages and we're called to be a part of a program then we will do that, you know, and we will engage, we'll discuss social justice issue on radio and on mm-hmm. TV. But in terms of to promote our events, um, it's expensive. <laughs> and so we don't generally do that. But also, based on just how the community works and organizes in Jamaica, it's much more useful to tap into the networks that exist mm-hmm. to be able to get persons to come. Because the truth is, as much as we're making progress, I don't think persons would feel completely safe um, if we, oh, or we publicly, well, not publicly because our pride is public and we promote it all over social media, but if we kind of aired on the radio or on TV that we're having an event, I don't know that it would inspire persons to to come out and show up, even though our pride response based on who is coming from the community has grown and grown and grown. I think, I don't know that persons would feel comfortable with that right now. I completely understand that. I understand. (laughs) I understand exactly what you're saying as far as that goes, because it's targeted. It's targeted to everybody in Jamaica who can see it, not just the community. So all kinds of other people might see it and see it as an opportunity, which is something I also mentioned previously, because as a Jamaican and as someone who identifies as a part of LGBT, I am always like, I want to go to Jamaica for pride, but I don't know, (laughs) you know what I'm saying, if that's something that I would necessarily feel safe doing. I understand, though, I've heard that the last one you guys did, or the one you guys did, there was mass security and everything of that nature, and I didn't hear any kind of, you know, negative anything about it. So We've had, I mean, so there are two prides that are organized in Jamaica. There's Pride JA, which generally, which most of the activities happen in Kingston, that JFLAG organizes, but we do have activities in other parishes. And then there's Montego Bay Pride, Mm -hmm. which is organized separately. Um, 
we do have security at all our events, but generally you should have security at any event. Mm -hmm. But we've never had in the three years we've been hosting Pride any interference from external persons. And so when I think about um, not advertising publicly, my fear is really not a person hearing that, oh, this, this Pride event is happening there. Because if you look at where our events were, for example, our Pride Sports Day was at um, uh, the U the University of the West End is the Mona Bowl, which is right beside oh. Augustown, which is now, mm -hmm. which is a, known as a volatile community <laughs> that is now experiencing an upsurge in violence, unfortunately, because I have family that lives there. However, the point is our pride events aren't hidden, really, because okay. even like the <laughs> beach pic the beach picnic that we had um, last year on August seventh, the banner for the beach picnic was on the side of the highway because oh. the beach was along the highway so we were like oh my gosh we really put up a, 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 a <laughs> feather banner here and it was fine over two almost well somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 members of the community and allies on the beach having oh, fun wow. and guess what there was another event a mainstream party happening right beside us and we hadn't our only fear was that people were having too much fun and might hurt themselves <laughs> Okay, so, that's good. Jamaica's growing. Yeah, it really has. And um, the, the sad truth is that when we think about, um, as far as our parties are concerned, because our parties are now happening in spa in a lot of very open spaces okay. that I never thought we'd be able to have parties. And I'm not just talking about um, JFLAG-related events. I'm talking about events that are organized by party promoters within the community. And mm -hmm. trust me, they're the real leaders of the community in terms of <laughs> bringing yeah. people together and building networks. And they're having parties in spaces that I never thought would be possible. And they really don't have to worry about external invasion, I okay. guess. But just ensuring that fights don't pop off and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, nothing internally goes okay. awry. On the topic of that, I saw you said something about Club Manhattan. They actually added me on Instagram too. Did you get a chance to look into that? I so they did add me um, as well. I I know of it. I've never been, but I know they keep weekly events, and oh. it's a space that I've been that has held um, parties before, LGBT parties before. Okay. So I guess they've now just made it a space dedicated to hosting events for the community. Okay. So I haven't been though. Okay. But I know it's a space that has been used for those events before. Okay. When you were in school, were they, um, were there community, um, I shouldn't say community, were there organizations for LGBTQ and allies while you were in school that you were a part of? Well, well, when I was on campus, well, definitely not in high school, because come on. Well, yeah, no. Yeah, uh, yeah, you be. <laughs> well, they do have Pride in Action on campus, which um, provides a safe space for members of the community who are on campus to be able to meet every two weeks and just talk about different issues, watch a movie, that kind of thing. And now they have a formal space where persons can meet and have a good time. Okay. And as far as outside of school, I, like, like I said, I don't live home, so I don't know what exactly is available as far as that goes. Are there, outside of, you know, the organizations that you're involved in, like, as how did you get to that point? I know you said that based on internships and things you did in school, were they directly related to these groups that you just mentioned? Or is it something external? Like, did someone introduce you or was it like an external group? Like, you know, you guys have friends and you hang out and say, oh, I heard about this. Like, how exactly did you come to... Um, Equality Youth J A and J Flag. Well, um, well, just say the truth is, as and we were on the last live that me and my, uh, my good coworker and best friend Swell did. We were talking about how that there are not a lot of diverse spaces for members of the community to meet outside of parties. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I would have been in and around the party, different party scenes to kind of know people within the community. Okay. But in terms of engaging with um, equality youth, it's because I had a lecturer who does this kind of advocacy and she introduced me to okay. JFLAG. So that was me. But there are, I mean, outside of JFLAG and its affiliates, other civil society organizations who do work with the community, but it's usually from a, a 
an HIV framework. Okay. And right. So because you know the rates of transmission are higher among yes. men who have sex with men, they get funding to do that kind of work. And so some of them find creative ways of engaging the community, and that's a space for some people to meet and develop bonds and friendships. Okay. Would you be interested in doing like your own type of nightlife event, like through like like I said, you guys do a lot of daytime events and things of that nature, and I see you guys. Well, we, we uh, have, okay, we have. So we so we did uh, uh, what we call a round robin mm-hmm. event in Jamaica. So what that is, so a group of party promoters come together and they hold they host a they host individually um, a party, and they basically create this funding ring where they each provide the startup capital for each um, party that they have. And then everything that they make from the party in terms of patrons coming in and buying liquor is profits. Okay. So it goes around in a circle. It's like what we call a partner in Jamaica, but it's a partner with parties. <laughs> so, this okay. year, so this year we did what we had a uh, round robin. But we do have events like that. So we use, we have PRISM. Um, which is an event that we've had um, since 2015. Um, and it has taken different forms in terms of it could be an arts-based event or just a party. And we've had that um, a couple of times over the past few years. We mm-hmm. have our anniversary event. Last year it took the form of a black tie event. And the truth is in Jamaica, no matter what, what kind of event you go to, if there's music involved, is going to end up being a soca slash dance <laughs> predominantly dance. Yes. So, I mean, we do keep different events in the year, um, like lines and and well, I wouldn't support groups. For, that's not really an entertainment space, but like the different lines that we keep and opportunities for members of the community to just come together and have a good time. We do those every now and then. What I would love to see is much more are much more diverse spaces being created by persons within the community outside of JFLAG. Okay. So more people investing in like um, different fun days and trips and stuff like that, that, you know, community members can go on and have a good time together, you know, that because not everyone is the party type. Yes. <laughs> and so, yeah. Do they have, uh, are you guys big on brunch there? Because I'm realizing that brunch is becoming more and more popular here, especially in the um, gay community. <laughs> so that would probably be an idea if you guys are, you know, privy to that. Well, we're big on breakfast parties. That's what's <laughs> Okay, here. okay. So um, just to give you an idea, it's a, a, a party that starts about 7 a.m. in the morning. You have oh. breakfast, you have tea, you have, you know, liquor, and you just party until like the afternoon. Okay. So is we this... had one for Pride last year. It was amazing. Oh, that's... <laughs> How often do you guys have those? When I come down, I might need to come by. <laughs> I mean, we're going to have one this year for Pride again, I think. But once again, <laughs> like, so while we try to do a lot of community engagement work, mm-hmm. um, the most, the core of our funding comes from more like advocacy-related activities. So we have to constantly seek support for our community engagement work because the people really ain't interested in giving us money to create the spaces that are necessary to push the movement forward. Um, sadly, people tend to focus on like legal reform a bit too much uh, without necessarily seeing the need to do that kind of building community kind of work. Mm-hmm. So as much as we'd like to have and facilitate more kind of social events that we can use as spaces to gather and mobilize, it's not as frequent as we would like. Okay. How has the Jamaican government um, received you guys? Because I saw that you guys approached them with the manifesto and there are things in the manifesto that directly relates to how the government is towards members of the LGBTQ community as far as, you know, equal rights and health and all these other things. Like, have you guys interacted with anyone individually or specifically to see, like, what their idea is or how they've received it? Well, we have. Well, the manifestos are still being printed. We- we're gonna get. Like, so we're gonna. We printed a bunch of copies, and we're going to be distributing them and using them as the basis for having formal meetings. But every year around International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, we have a round of policy meetings with persons in government, private sector, 
um, amongst the society. We have, we've had a few with religious leaders to kind of gauge support for the community. Okay. And so um, we have a working relationship with, um, with a few politicians. We have a good relationship with the Ministry of Health, a good relationship with Ministry of Youth. And we did have representatives from both our persons who work in both ministries at the launch for the event. Okay. Do you feel like your time frame for the manifesto is realistic? Well, to be fair, if you look at the manifesto, what we try to do is align it with Jamaica's Vision 2030 goals. Mm -hmm. So I don't, it wasn't that we were saying that all of these things, the only thing that I think was specifically time stamped was the youth unemployment recommendations specifically. Yes. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, everything was, what we were doing was saying that if you want to achieve your Vision 2030 goals that you, the government, established, then you have to start looking at these issues. So it was tying it to a national development goal so that our governments could understand the importance and how these are connected to the broader national development issues. Do we think that they're going to fix all of this by 2030? No. Mm -hmm. But in terms of getting them to understand that these kinds of concerns must be a part of the conversation is definitely something that we can do between now and, um, well, we'd, we'd get them to more than understand by 2030, I think, but getting them to have a certain understanding we can do within the next few years because we're going into a new strategic planning phase okay. and the gear agenda provides the philosophical frame for us to do that. It kind of sets all of the things that we know as an organization we should be looking at, addressing, and allows us to keep those in mind as we do our work. Okay. Do you feel like the age of the people involved in government would affect like how successful these achievements would be? Like, Do you think the younger people or older people or whoever would receive it better than a different generation? I mean, so statistically, the truth is that there's tolerance higher among youth. However, I've, because of how our government tends to work um, and who tends to be at the top tends to be much more mature persons and they're more you know, critical for decision making. And because I've seen where you can have just one strong supporter in the government who is at the top, who is older, I wouldn't necessarily focus too much on the age. I know that we have a leg up when we're talking to young people. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like there are there there is sorry a lot of opportunities to do work with persons in government who are older, and the truth is they tend to have more sway anyway, so they should be a big part of who we're targeting. Okay, okay, I completely understand what you're saying with that. Um, this is completely off topic. I've been looking at a bunch of videos and pictures and stuff of you, and I'm just curious: Are you into fashion design at all? So I had a best friend, and I say had because he passed last year, and he was a designer. So that's largely where a lot of my fashion interest comes from. But I'm not a designer. My two best friends, actually, I had two best friends at one time that were designers. One has passed, as I said, and the other is abroad, um, learning Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm asking because of the split sleeve jackets I've been seeing. I've seen you in quite a few of those. <laughs> I have a couple of capes. I bought them online. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. The was that the shirt you wore for the um the proposition for the manifesto with the rainbow paint dripping? Oh, that I bought online as well. As oh, really? Because well. yeah. I thought that was like an original piece or something. I didn't even go into looking into that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> thank you for the shout out, but no. Okay. I have to put my things together. Okay. Okay. Um. Well, I want to thank you because I feel like I've asked, you know, a few questions um, as far as that goes. Um, one of the things that I saw in the manifesto that it's something that it happens here, too, because as far as healthcare goes and, you know, if you're in a relationship with someone of the same gender, you don't get the right to sometimes even see them if they're hospitalized. And I'm pretty sure that's the same thing that's going on in Jamaica as well. Like if, you know, somebody's in a hospital or something, you can't go because you're not on their next of kin or something of the sort like that. And well, not, not quite. Not quite? 
because, I mean, I guess because our hospitals don't necessarily have those kind of setups where they're in pri- persons are in private rooms, everyone is just everywhere. Okay. If you've ever been to the Kingston Public Hospital, a lot of the wards that people are on are just like big open areas. Okay. So they're, they're, they're not that strict on who can visit um, who. Because um, like I said, my friend was in the hospital. I was able to visit him. So okay. there was no barrier. There, had, there really is no I haven't seen the barrier there. Where I see the barrier is when, of course, when visiting hours are over and they only allow parents generally. Um, I'm probably a spouse, but I, I haven't heard persons having challenges in that particular regard here. And then really, uh, the, our hospitals really aren't outfitted really to have persons stay overnight at all with um, any relative or partner that is hospitalized, if we're thinking about the Kingston Public Hospital. Okay. Um, one of the things I was wondering about also, who would just slip me? Um, <laughs> with, oh my gosh, it just slipped me. Oh Jesus, I'm going right. <laughs> okay, next subject then. Um, as far as that goes, let's say, well, that's a benefit anyways, as far as being in Jamaica, because it is much stricter here as far as visitation goes. I mean, as far as friends and family, it's the same thing. Like during regular operational hours, it's the same thing for the most part. Um, I was wondering, I see that there are a few people, well, of course, there's trans people living in Jamaica. Are there, is there like hospitals or doctors that would reach out to you guys as far as letting you know, hey, I'm safe for you to come to as far as that? Or is that things that you have to go basically abroad to get done? If you want to get surgery, like top surgery or bottom surgery, if you're transitioning. So you can't do top surgery and bottom surgery in Jamaica. Those services are not offered. Okay. And they're not enough. And that's why one of the recommendations under the section regarding persons of trans experience, we looked at the reality that there are not a lot of endocrinologists, people who specialize in hormone Mm -hmm. treatment in, in the island. And so, and there are not really a lot of them in the public health system. And so the kind of access to treatment um, is not truly a reality. And frankly, very few people know about trans health care within the public health system. So actually, it's through our work at JFLAG that a lot of doctors are being sensitized to the reality. Okay. Because we, like last year, we trained over 300 doctors and public health workers broadly, not just doctors, but people across the the public health um, system at all levels. And we did that. We did over 300 a year before as well. And it, through these sensitization sessions, we're getting them to understand about, of course, providing stigma-free service, but also understanding the particular health needs of members of the LGBT community, particularly okay. the trans community. Okay. Do you guys have um, like therapy, psychology, um, psychologists that work with you know the community and things of that nature? In direct re- um, relation to LGBTQ, of course, there's therapists, but are you aware of so, any? So TransWave does a support group, and TransWave is J- JFLAG's trans affiliate. And through their support group, they do engage a psychologist who can come in, who does come in and do one-on-one sessions with members of the community. And we have been approached by mental health specialists as well who said, you know, they're interested in being able to provide service to the community so that they know that it's a safe space. And so we're going to be building a relationship with them as well so that persons know um, that that is an option. But of course, mental health care, which is largely private, is expensive. That was going to be my next question. (laughs) If any of these services are, you know, offered. So the one that Transwave (laughs) offers, that's free because the organization pays for that but that that's not obviously not as regular so you'd have to go to the support group and and you know transit can do a one and pay for one-on-one but the other entity is not necessarily free that has reached out to us okay i saw that you guys are also accepting like reports of abuse and things of the um, injustice and things like that within the community is that something that you guys collect for necessary like survey reasons or for what exactly is the purpose of that what are you guys I mean, doing well, with this information, basically? So it's the honest advocacy that is necessary. And so that kind of information feeds into the kind of advocacy that I would do in whatever spaces I'm in. So 
you, for us to say that there's an issue in Jamaica, we need to have the proof. Okay. And so we collect those reports to kind of bolster our work in different spaces to say, okay, this needs to be addressed because here's a challenge here. The you know, amount of cases we've had reported, and this is how we, this is what we need to do. Because if you don't have those kind of numbers, and you, you're gonna have a problem when you go in front of an official, and they're gonna be like, "But I don't, what, what proof do you have?" So that's largely what that is about. However, it's important to note that when persons do come to make these reports, we do provide referrals to them, and we let them know about their options in terms of where they can go if they want to report it, if they don't want to report it. And we're also building relationships with different um, social service entities so that we can send persons or rather refer persons to those entities so that they can get any support that they offer. Okay. Um, to backtrack a little bit on the therapy, is there an age range for people who can attend the, a um, the meetings, the group meetings, or is this just all ages are welcome? So we do have... Um, internal policies which prevent us from doing work with persons who are under 18. Okay. And I know for a lot of persons, it's a bit of a challenge, but we took the the position that given, you know, how Jamaica is, particularly with the Child Care and Protection Act, which says that if a child is engaging in, is a child in need of, um, was it, I don't remember the term, in care, child in need of care and attention. I think that's the legal term. I should know this offhand. <laughs> Essentially, if, a, if there's a, ch a child who a crime has been committed against, then you have to report it. So if a child who is having sex, whether it be um, heterosex or homosex, comes to us, we're required by law to report it, which defeats the entire purpose. Yes. And also, we have to bear in mind the potential harm of the organization being seen as a recruiting organization, <laughs> sadly. Mm -hmm. But we we drew a line about who we can engage and drew that line at 18 years of age. Okay. How would you address, uh, or for other people, like address being gay with family members? Like how would you, as far as like coming out or even just starting a conversation? <laughs> I mean, my advice to persons is always to... Um, before we even, you know, you have that kind of conversation, is just assess your realities. Um, uh -huh. You have to take a close look at um, who you know your relatives to be and who they <laughs> are, and whether or not they will do something drastic if you, if you say this. Because um, there's no one way to, quote-unquote, come out to your family. And it really depends on the subjective experiences of the relationships that you have with your parents and your siblings. I mean, one at a time works for some people all at once, works for some people. I mean, showing the signs works for some people. Um, and some people just have to wait until they're independent to do it. Um, so it really depends on the relationships you have with your family. But I would suggest that... We seek to build good relationships with our family <laughs> because, oh, no, I mean, the truth is yeah. that it's a lot easier for um, persons to deal with the, the cultural shock of having a queer child when they um, have a strong relationship with them so that that kind of counterbalances all of the fears and anxieties and discomforts that they've been trained to have. Um, are socialized to have. And so that's what I would always suggest, that if we build certain relationships with members of our family, which won't always be easy because we don't choose our family, and then some mm. people just can't build certain relationships with. But depending on the relationship that you have, it might make things much easier. I completely agree with that because I, I always say, wait until you can move out before you talk about it if you know your parents are ignorant in that like frame. So... I completely agree with everything you just said as far as that goes. Um, I don't know if I have any more questions for you. Do you have anything you want to ask? Okay. Um, well, based on the previous interview that you had, um, I just wanted to clarify that we don't, we're not stopping at just creating the agenda. So there's a, we're doing an entire social media thing where we put the agenda in small bite-sized pieces ah. to explain to persons. And as I said, we'll be doing consultations with members of the community. We'll be having meetings with different persons in government and private sector 
because the point is to use it as a starting point. And it really says as much that, we're go that we want to use it to begin having that kind of conversation and present an image of the community that ha has not always been a reality and that challenges the negative hegemonic images that exist ar about and around the local LGBT community. And so rather than expecting to read this 34 page <laughs> document um, from top to bottom, and truly each section of it can stand on its own. Um, and uh, you can just, if you're depending on what your area of interest is, mm -hmm. just read the section and see what we're interested in. But we do plan on cutting it up and making it easier, doing um, posters, doing small information briefs so that people get what we're actually going to be focusing on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, completely. Um, that's one of the things that yeah we did discuss on the last one. I completely forgot about that part. Um, as far as, and I guess that's what you guys do, are doing with the live also with the um equality use yeah. live. Okay, yeah, because I actually came across that uh pretty late. I saw that a couple weeks ago after um having the conversation with Majan actually, and I was like, oh, I wonder if she saw this <laughs> because I saw that you guys did address like a lot of the topics that we did discuss in the phone interview. And I was, I, I personally know that because I'm looking these things up, like we said, I'm going to find it and other people who are interested will find it. So, I mean, yeah, every... Somehow we tend to promote our stuff online. So we actually do paid ads on Facebook. Okay. It, a lot of it goes to people. We do it in such a way to ensure that it goes to people who normally wouldn't search for our stuff. That's why sometimes you see crazy comments on our posts because the paid ad shows up on people based on what they like. And, and so it tends to always be in front of the Jamaicans that you wouldn't expect to be on a J flags page. Yes. I saw some of the comments under, I'm not sure if it was one of your, yeah, one of your videos or I saw an interview that Diana King did with very GD um, TV and some of the comments underneath it. I was like, Oh my goodness, people like, if you don't like it, just be quiet. <laughs> but I understand. Um, it's, the same thing when I do my ads also. I select the people that I want it to go to, though, specifically. I know that it gives you the option to do, like, the demographic of people you follow and people like that. So I can completely understand why those kind of comments would come about. But, I mean, either way it goes, you know, at least you're still spreading the word and it's reaching them. So whether they have negative outlook yeah. or not, they might come back again or they might show somebody else and they might say, oh, well, on another note, you know, it's not so bad, you know, because <laughs> at the end of the day, all we want yeah. is to just be treated like a regular human being. <laughs> and the more visibility, the more conversation is the further we can go. I think Jamaica has benefited from consistent, uh, particularly in the past 10 years or so, a consistent, consistent presence of um, discussion around these issues that has definitely over time softened perspectives and shifted some altogether. Okay, that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm, me personally, I am glad I found this, you guys, and I'm glad that there's so much going on in Jamaica because my thing is, I wonder what life would be like for me growing up in Jamaica if I never left, you know? Like, because I'm very expressive with myself. Like I said, I wear a rainbow flag and everything. I'm flag waving all the time. So I just, the fact that I'm pretty sure there's someone there like me that's like, yes, thank you for this. So, you know what I'm saying? I've, I'm very, very proud of the organization. I'm grateful that it's there. And, you know, I'm, you guys are doing really great things. And <laughs> you know, so I'm just, me personally, I'm very appreciative of the cause and the fact that you guys actually took the courage to do this to begin with, to actually start this. Because I'm pretty sure there were some apprehensions and it was probably months and months of discussions before it actually was formulated and set in stone, like, this is what we're doing. So, I mean, kudos to you guys. <laughs> So much. I mean, and I also just want to use the opportunity to kind of thank some of the people that made it possible. Um, I ha I really bothered a bunch of writers, a bunch <laughs> of my colleagues, like, okay, write this, and I need this done by a particular time because we need to get this out. And, <laughs> you know, and especially Sue L, she has such a great support. And, and, and the people who I asked, like, the models on the cover, they were really great, and they didn't get a lot of notice. So all of the people and our graphic designer who really came together and yeah, they did really great work, and we really just hope to use this as a pivot to bring conversations further so that, you know, we can, you know, go into the next phase of our advocacy. 
Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I thank you so much for calling in. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you guys for listening. Um, I want to thank Glenn Roy Murray again for calling in and talking to us about the gay agenda and, you know, basically the things surrounding living in Jamaica as LGBT. I hope you guys learned something from this. Um, we discussed, of course, you know, the manifesto, the title and all these things. For anyone that's interested, you guys can contact JFLAG. They have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of these other outlets that you guys can reach them on. Um, if you're living in Jamaica, you can um, contact them as far as volunteering goes and things of that nature. So, I mean, there's opportunities there. So, you know, just like every other week, whether you got here on purpose or by fate, thank you for tuning in. And don't forget to follow us on all social media networks, Pointless Talks on Twitter, Pointless Talks on Instagram, Pointless Talks on Facebook, um, listen on SoundCloud, Pointless Talks Podcast, Apple Music, Pointless Talks Podcast, and all of the above. Thank you.